In this video, I'm going to share with you my tips and tricks for making awesome assembled things with 3D printing. I've been making all kinds of electromechanical weirdness for years and, well, I've learned a lot on the way. Let's get started. So what do I mean when I say assemblies using 3D printing? Well, that's when you 3D print the parts for a project that has things in it. So whether the parts assemble together with screws or you have motors, batteries, Arduinos, all kinds of different things that you're making fit into this custom project you've designed using 3D printing to make it. And well, I've been using 3D printing to do this kind of thing for ages, from combat robots all the way to cosplay glowing swords and everything in between. And well, if you're working with real world objects, my first tip is to start with graph paper. Grab the components you're gonna be using for your project and lay them out on some graph paper to see if they fit together at all. This is a really great way to sanity check your project to see if it actually fits into the volume you're thinking of and to sort of figure out configurations. So for example, with my combat robots in the ant weight class, they only weigh 150 grams and the components are very small indeed. So by using a piece of graph paper, I can figure out different configurations, where the wheels would be, where the motors go, where the batteries are. And this is a really great way to figure out if your design is gonna work at all before wasting any time in your CAD software. Tip number two, the three prototype rule. Now, I don't actually know where I heard this. I've heard it scattered around the internet and in person for years, but the idea is that you have three shots to make a project. The first iteration is almost always incorrect. The second one nails a lot of things, but it's not quite there. But your third prototype is where you get it right. And what's really interesting is this seems to be true most of the time. And what I've done over the years is I've refined my design process to embrace this three prototype rule to go from design concept to final product. So what I'll do is I'll start with a really rough first prototype. I know it's not gonna be perfect. I know it's not gonna work, not gonna work first time. I've accepted that. I'm not trying to perfect it in CAD because when you print something out and you bring it into the real world, there'll always be something slightly off. Maybe the design dimensions aren't quite right. Maybe you didn't account for a certain component size or how it plugs into something. When you get something tangible in your hands, that's when you start to go, oh yeah, maybe I should have done it a little bit differently. And it's only after that that I'll move on to my second prototype where I put a lot more effort into the 3D model. I'll make sure that it's properly done parametrically. Maybe I'll have components, that kind of thing. And I'll learn everything I did from that draft CAD, that scrap CAD, and I'll put it into my prototype. And most of the time, this is almost perfect. Very rarely do I get it correct on the second go, but usually it's almost there. Maybe something's not quite fitting right. Maybe I didn't account for a wire or such, but it's almost there. And then what I'll do is I'll take everything from my scrap CAD, my first prototype, and then my more refined second prototype and put it into my final design. And very rarely do I need to do any more prototyping. So my takeaway here is don't try to get it right on the first go because it probably won't be. Just rush out the first version, get something tangible and play around with it in the real world and then note down what needs to be changed and put it into your second and third design and you'll have something awesome that works really well before you know it. Tip number three, add clearance, but add it at the end. We are talking about designing things that are 3D printed and assembled around real world components. And well, the real world isn't perfectly accurate. You can't design something and print it to be perfectly 20 millimeters long because there'll be some variation. And we need to account for that when we assemble things. And you do that by adding clearances into your components. These are parts that fit together. You want them to fit together easily. You don't wanna make your life harder by having to sand and fix up parts after they've been printed. You want them to be printed and just slot together with minimal effort. My CAD program of choice right now is Autodesk Fusion and I do that in this software using the push pull command. So what I'll do is I'll get the components where they will intersect with each other or mate together and then I will push pull the surfaces away from each other 0.3 millimeters. This is a number that I found is a very good sort of baseline for FDM slash FFF 3D printing processes where parts generally fit together with minimal effort with a little bit of play, but not too much. But your preferences might vary. For example, if you're using resin 3D printers, you can probably get away with more accurate parts. Therefore, you might want less clearances. Or for example, if you're printing stuff that needs to be sanded and polished and painted, well, I recommend adding even more clearance if you can. For example, 0.5 millimeters to make sure that parts go together. And my final tip for this section, add a lot of clearance in areas where it doesn't matter. 
Don't make stuff fit together when it doesn't need to. Make your life easier. Give those areas, I don't know, a millimeter of clearance if it doesn't need to be perfectly mated together, because trust me, you'll need them and you'll thank me later. Tip number four, threaded inserts are awesome. 3D printed plastic isn't that strong. And when you're tapping screws into it, especially if you need to undo them and do them up repeatedly, it strips out and then you're left with a part that you can't properly secure together. Threaded inserts, however, fix this problem. These are specially designed heat set inserts that you insert using a soldering iron or dedicated heat set insert tool, and they will melt into your part, securing in place a thread that you can use again and again and again with fasteners. I used to try to fasten prints together just using plastic tap screws for years. And then when I discovered heat set inserts, they changed my life and I use them all the time. I buy them by the hundred and I use them in all my projects. Stefan from CNC Kitchen sells some really high quality ones and they are cost effective enough to use in your 3D printing projects without blowing out the budget. So I love to use threaded inserts for stuff that has to be assembled that might need to be disassembled later. But I do have one pro tip when it comes to fasteners and 3D printed projects in general, and that is to find a screw length that you can actually buy. For example, in this handle, I have some threaded inserts and the screws are inserted into one part, securing it to the other. Well, the depth of that fastener has to match an existing fastener size off the shelf that I can buy. Otherwise, there'll be minimum thread engagement or it'll bottom out and won't fully secure in place. It might be something you don't think about, but you cannot buy every length of screw, especially in Australia. And you don't want to be sitting there having to angle grind screws shorter just to fit them into your projects because I have been there. So when it comes to your designs in CAD before you even print anything, make sure you design with a set screw length in mind. So what I tend to do these days is I leave a millimeter or so clearance at the bottom of the threaded insert and go from that size to the top of the part that's being secured. And I will choose a length uh, between those parts that actually exists. And yeah, it has saved me so much pain doing this just one tiny check. If you're interested in upping your 3D printing game, then maybe consider joining the Makers Muse community. For only five bucks a month, you get access to me behind the scenes, and you can see what I've been working on, and you can ask questions in our very popular and successful troubleshooting forum. I'd love to see you there. You can find links in the description below. Tip number five, wires exist and they break easily. It is so easy to forget when you're designing complex parts with 3D printed components that if there's electronics, well, the electronic parts have to be joined together and you do that with wires and it's so easy to forget that you have to keep wires in mind when you're designing those parts in 3D modeling software. Just as an example, this is Pancake, my Antweight Combat Robot. Look at all those wires. I had to allow room in the design for those wires to exist and they've been made as small as physically possible. Wire fatigue is a very real problem when it comes to making projects with electronics inside. You need to keep in mind that these wires will be moved if you disassemble and move the components around or you put a battery in, for example, where do you move that connector? Do you pull and push it? Will solar joints break? It's something that's actually very often overlooked and it's very well worth taking some time to consider wire routing before you send your model, especially if you're doing a production run, because there's nothing worse than having wires fatigue when you've sent something out to someone and they're like, oh, this broke or this shorted out. I don't know what happened when it's actually your fault for not taking into account the wires in your project. I have two big tips when it comes to wire in your projects. Number one is to use silicon wire. This is very soft, flexible wire that makes routing the wires in your projects a lot easier than the much harder PVC coated wire, and especially never use solid core wire because that will instantly fatigue the moment you move it. But also just for 3D printers, you need to keep in mind wire strain relief. So if you have, for example, a battery cable coming off your microcontroller to a battery and it you know, runs through the, through the project, you don't want to just have that floating because every time someone moves that cable to plug the battery in or unplug it, it's going to put strain on those solar joints on the microcontroller and eventually fatigue them. So what you actually need to do is some strain relief by anchoring that wire somewhere in your project so when it's moved, it doesn't transfer those forces to the solar joints on the microcontroller. And again, with combat robots, strain relief is the name of the game. If your wires break, your robot does too. Tip number six, if it's hidden, keep it rough. If you have a design where people are gonna see the outside of it, you want the outside to look good, but the inside, if that's gonna be hidden away, Keep it rough and keep it functional. This is something I've been guilty of, trying to make the internals of designs 
too detailed with de dedicated wire routing paths and small indents and things that don't need to exist. But more often than not, just having a large cavity inside your design to hold all your electronics and parts is better than trying to have dedicated little keyed areas that hold stuff perfectly in place with only like half a millimeter of clearance between each component. Because again, having a large cavity lets you run wires and wires are messy and take up space. So when you have a design that has lots of internal details, make them work for you. Don't try to make them fancy and clean. And this especially comes down to finishing prints if you're gonna be sanding and painting them. Don't work on parts that no one sees. Number seven, consider your material choice. There are so many different kinds of 3D printing plastics on the market today. By far though, the most common is PLA Plus, which is a modified type of PLA. It's tough, it's easy to print with, and I use it for most of my projects. But the thing with PLA Plus is it has terrible temperature resistance. If I left this in my car on a hot summer day, it would start to deform. And that can be an issue if your project is gonna be in a high temperature environment, or if it contains high temperature components. Any sort of circuitry that runs hot, like a motor, motor control, or even batteries in some cases, can transfer that heat into the surrounding plastic and deform it. So what other options are there? Well, PTG is a decent choice. I'm not a big fan of the material, but it's got a high temperature resistance to PLA. There's also TPU, which gives you a soft, squishy design, but can have issues with dimensional accuracy and print finish. And then there's high temperature stuff like carbon fiber nylon, or ABS or ASA, all those materials will withstand high temperatures, but you may struggle to get the dimensional accuracy you can get out of PLA+. So choose your materials wisely. And also consider the fact that you might not want to 3D print everything in the first place. 3D printing itself is a fantastic technology, but it's not the be all and end all of processes. There's many other things you can use in a 3D printed design that may serve the project better than just printing everything. And as an example of how I've combined different processes, I've got this sword here, and this is designed with 3D printed parts that have been sanded and painted with laser cut acrylic because, well, you can't print nice large clear things, and laser cut acrylic has this really nice surface finish to it, which you just can't really achieve with 3D printing. And then the handle, well, this is plumbing pipe. It's just agriculture uh, plastic tube that makes the handle because it's gonna be far stronger than anything I could possibly 3D print because of the layer lines and it costs nothing and I could just buy it from the hardware store. So you combine different processes to make what you need. And I just see this way too often, people 3D printing everything for their project when really you can actually just use other stuff that's gonna cost less, take less time, and in the end, give a better result. Tip number eight is something I have been terribly guilty of in the past and that is to consider the assembly process. So if you have something that's got complex electronic parts in it with 3D printed enclosures, well, you've got to consider how those parts go into the enclosure and how the enclosure will actually secure together. So for example, with these two halves, they join together like this, but what's holding the electronics in place? How do I get the switch into place? Do I wire in the switch first and then try to mount it? Or do I mount it and then wire it into place? If you don't think about these things, you can land in a really tricky spot very far down the line when you finally try to bring everything together and you realize that you have to run a wire into something that's already assembled and you just can't do it. And that's when you start bringing out the Dremel and just ruining your beautiful 3D print. Tip number nine, screws are not locating features. What I see very often is people design an enclosure with two halves and let's say four screws. The screws go through holes that have some clearance around those screws. And then when you put the two halves together and you fasten it together, there's gonna be some wiggle between the two halves because of that clearance. They're not gonna be properly aligned. They'll always be a little bit off. So how do you overcome this? Well, you need to design in indexing features into your 3D model. Indexing features are details that are added to your parts to lock them into each other at certain orientations. So for example, in this design, I've got these indexing features that locate the two halves together without even having screws in it at all, you can see how they lock together. So they protrude from this half and you can see that they actually lock into a indent on this other half. I won't lie, designing good indexing features into your 3D model is definitely an advanced kind of CAD skill. It can be quite challenging to carve up a model into multiple parts 
that join together perfectly that's more complex than just a simple plain cut. The easiest way I've found to do it is using surfaces within Autodesk Fusion. So what I'll do is I'll draw a sketch with an indexing detail and then extrude that into a surface that's used to cut a body into two parts. So I won't try to model an indexing surface on one part and then the mating side on the other. That's just never gonna really work out. You're always gonna have issues with them aligning or maybe conflicting. But if I use an extruded surface and then cut the part with that surface, I find it's a really great controllable way to carve up parts with indexing features, which is not too much harder than just doing a simple plain cut and cutting something in two. Tip number 10, hot glue, our little naughty secret. I love to use hot glue in my projects, but again, I hide it so people can't see it. Hot glue is a great way of joining stuff together. So for my projects, if I want to secure a microcontroller down, dot of hot glue, stick the microcontroller down. If I want to run wires and make sure they stick to one location, bit of hot glue, stick the wires in. As long as no one sees it, who's to judge? And also I discovered recently that you can buy black hot glue, which hides it even more and looks actually half decent if you do have to see it. So don't be afraid, especially with prototyping, to use some hot glue, especially when it comes to wire fatigue. I use hot glue to hold wires in place because if they get pulled on, the worst case is it might pull a bit of hot glue free versus ripping the solder joints out of my expensive electronics. And that's gonna do it for this video for my tips of assembling complex electromechanical projects using 3D printing. But the next step would be to make your 3D prints not look like 3D prints at all. So stay tuned for that one. Thanks for watching guys, bye.